I am privileged, honored, and humbled even to be able to address you today and to speak on something I've never spoken on before, which is maybe good uh, for you and me, um, that we have some fresh stuff. But it's really, it's really combining a couple things that, that we've may heard them combined together before, but uh, maybe never spoken about together, because technically they, they don't travel in the scripture together overtly, right? It's like salt and pepper, we know they go together, but they're not really the same thing. Um, and so I want to I want to talk about something today that that does do that. Um, and you've you've heard it. You know the topic more because of the song that was written actually in the mid eight, or late eighteen hundreds um, by um, John Samus S A M M I S. And um, if if there was the equivalent of the sixties one hit wonders, remember that year that that era, that would have been him. Uh, he wrote one hymn that became popular, and that hymn was, if I say it, you will begin to sing it if you know it. I guarantee it. The hymn was called Trust and Obey. Because there's to be happy in Jesus, but to, yeah. Do you know the, the verses or just the chorus? Yeah, I don't know the verses either. I had to look them up. <laughs> And we're not going to sing them, but um, now it won't be able to get out of your head, probably. Um, but the concept of, of what I'm talking about is doing those two things together. And my hope today, uh, to let you know where we're headed, my hope today is that by the time I'm done uh, speaking in the next 40 minutes or so, we will have more tightly knit together those two concepts than they were before in your brain and, and in your heart so that we can understand the connection between our obedience, our desire to serve the Lord, and, and, trusting, and trusting him in the areas that require and are asking for our obedience. Because I don't think it would be uh, out of line to say that our obedience is greatly, greatly influenced by our ability to trust God in whatever it is he's asking us to obey him in. Would you agree with that? That's what I think is happening, is that our ability to obey and follow God, even in areas we want to go to, is intrinsically entwined with our ability to trust God for that journey. And so, you know, the Bible doesn't have a concise definition of trust even. So we're going to dig into trust a little bit, but um, you might find it in in a modern dictionary, but the Bible has a lot of different aspects. It's described as having confidence or reliance or faith in God. But it also involves like a deep belief in God's character and his promises and the reliability, we would say, the infallibility of his word, his written word, as well as any word he may speak to us. And so that's why trust is not a dictionary definition in the Bible. You have, there's multiple aspects. Similarly, the word Similarly, the word obedience is a complex word because even though it means things like dutiful submission, that just sounds like you're, you're trying to train a puppy, you know? And, and um, we have a puppy, and, um, and she's dutifully complying with our uh, desire for her to do something on a particular gray mat in our, in our family room. You, you're following me. Um, I don't have to use any risky words. Um, so, again, without trying to define them and then go back and deconstruct them, we're, what I want to try to do is meld them together. And so, but here's, here, let, let's go back to the beginning. So, um, trust and obey. I don't know if we put the title slide up there, but I made this last night going, I should probably have some image that depicts what I'm talking about. And um, that's a footprint, you know, walking in... And, and partly, I was going to use shoes, but really, when you think of putting shoes on, and this is maybe a poor metaphor, but it might stick with somebody, when you're walking, think of each foot as trust and obey. As you work your journey with the Lord, your walk with the Lord, you're trusting, you're obeying, you're trusting, you're obeying, and, and by doing that, putting one foot in front of the other in compliance with what God is asking you to do or where he's asking you to go, what he's asking you to adjust in your head or modify in your behavior, it's a trusting and obeying. It's a walk, it's a journey, and that may help you. But that's where, that's where the idea for that came from. But I want to look at Genesis 3.1, and this is where it really all kind of started. And there's so much rich, richness here that I'm tempted to not, 
to not dive in too deep, or I'm tempted to do it, but I won't dive in too deep. But this is where it all started, and I think this is the, the, the epicenter of, of why this becomes a challenge for us. And in Genesis 3, uh, by the way, God has put Adam in the garden. He has built all of creation, and all of creation is kind of hanging in suspense when, when um, Adam is asked to name all the animals, and Adam's naming the animals. That's where we get the word aardvark and, and you know, the kiwi bird that I don't think exists anymore. But it, it, um, we got these from Adam. I'm joking, but you know what I'm saying. So, um, but f- here's the thing. This discovery happened. This light bulb moment for Adam came when he goes, for every male, there's a corresponding female. But for me, there's no one. And so when Adam realized he was alone in the world, God caused a great sleep to come on him. And uh, that great sleep... Um, was God doing a procedure <laughs> where he removed a rib and out of that rib, God fashioned the woman. And you can think of all the theological implications of that, but out of the one man came the woman and together they are mankind. And now Adam, then Adam says, well, look, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, she'll be called a woman because she came out of me. So the last thing he named was the woman. All of creation kind of held in suspension going, yeah, this isn't going to work if there's only one male person. And so all of creation was really just on hold until she showed up. And, and quite frankly, in many young men's lives, that's how their life is, is that they are realizing they're alone in the world and, um, and they go looking for that woman who's suitable. And so... So that, that's, the, that's the backstory, chapters one and two. Opening of chapter three, now the serpent, now we have an introduction of a new character in the garden. So far, it's just Adam and Eve and God, <clears throat> excuse me. But now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. By the way, which tells me that Adam is somewhat familiar with the serpent in, in the animal form, not in the devil form. Um, so anyway, so he was more crafty than any of the well animals the Lord God made. He said to the woman, <clears throat> did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from any tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. <clears throat> you will not certainly die, the serpent said. Yeah, thank you, dear. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, <clears throat> you will certainly not die. Um, uh, he said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. Which, by the way, if you look later in chapter 3, God removes the tree of life from the garden, which is also there, so they won't eat of that and live forever in this fallen state. But here's the thing. We sometimes think the temptation to do something gets us in the fray, and then once we do it, the thing that we were tempted to do, it really isn't available to us. But in this case, the Lord says later in chapter 3, he says, he goes, now the, 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 the man and the woman are like us, knowing good and evil, let's remove the tree. So they actually obtained that which they were tempted to obtain. It wasn't just some, some phantom that was moving around. So, but here's the thing. At the heart of this temptation is the fact that God is withholding something good from you that you deserve. At the heart of this temptation of trusting me in creation, in the garden, you can do anything you want, but trust me, don't touch that tree or eat of that tree. This one question from the serpent dismantled the trust that they were to have in God by getting them to do what? Doubt that God had their their best intention in mind. And once they obtained what they were tempted to obtain, it changed everything. I don't think that it only happened, and that happens with us as well. The enemy will tell you it's not a big deal. God's withholding something from you, and you should obtain it. And so when you do, you find out it's not fulfilling at all. In fact, quite the opposite. 
It takes us down paths we never wanted to go, and now here we are right in the middle of that path. Some of you are sitting here today as the consequences of some of those decisions you made back when. But the Lord is here to help you, to restore you, and to rebuild you. The trust that he has put in you to follow him is still there, and he will continue to guide you. But this is where this pursuit began. What separates our ability to follow God comes down to the root of what happened in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve just didn't trust that God really had their best in mind. And a seed was sown that, that deteriorated their, their desire to obey God. And their relationship with God and our relationship with God is fundamentally uh, deteriorated. But the connection between trust, trusting God and following God is difficult. On the one hand, it's a big event. On the other hand, it's actually made up of a whole bunch of little things, right? And I remember, Lord help me, uh, uh, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I didn't even know until right now that maybe this is a story that could be helpful. I remember um, when I first became a Christian in my early 20s, I... I happened to not have enough money to get things that I wanted, and so I often would steal them, like in a store, department store, grocery store, and I got so regular, I almost didn't even think about it. Yeah, that's me, Pastor Craig. Yeah. Uh, But, and the same thing is at play, I didn't know the Lord then, but I remember very distinctly, after becoming a Christian, going to the same store, I had to stop myself just before I left the store and ask myself, did I take something? My heart had changed. I didn't want to, but I had developed such a rhythm and such a cadence and convinced myself to ignore the fact that I had just done. I truly was not letting my right hand know what my left hand was doing. And I, at times, would frisk myself. I go, did I take something? Now, that was short-lived, not very long, <clears throat> but it was, <clears throat> it was a part of coming out of a, 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 a probably a decade-long history of, of taking things. And... But when God's trying to rebuild or, re, or build for the first time your character, the Holy Spirit is faithful to bring these things to mind, right? I remember being at somebody's house, the same thing. I'd just become a Christian. And um, I was, whatever I was doing in the bathroom, washing my hands. And I saw that they had something under the counter that I had been trying to buy, but I couldn't afford it. And so you know what the first thought was? To take it. Even though I had already been through this thing with the department stores and all this stuff, I'm still in the throes of, and I, I remember the, I, I would say now it was the Holy Spirit, but in my mind it was just a thought. And I was like, listen, I'm not a, that person anymore. And for crying out loud, that thing only costs like five or ten dollars. My character is worth more than that. Yeah. Right? And I'm telling you that story because those are the thoughts that will come to you that are from the Holy Spirit, when you're desiring to take a different course of action and obey the Lord, the Holy Spirit will show up in those ways. That's why I can say to you, you may have been in a place where you're reaping the consequences of decisions, but you can always change and go back. You can still become the person you wanted to be. Amen? Amen. With the Lord's help, you can be that person, but he will show that uh, up in that way, very practically and very uh, thoughtfully, and you'll think it's your thoughts, but it's the Lord. And really, it's up to then for you to do all over again, do I trust this as Lord, and am I going to obey that? However, many times we put this trust and obey thing, and and I don't want to de-escalate this, but we sometimes put it only in their huge things. Like, I'm trusting God for, I'm going to move across this, the, the country and have no idea what's going to happen. And that's not maybe trusting God. It might be something else. But some of you, um, maybe you, remember, remember Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Remember that movie? Oh, yeah. Some people really like it. And um, 
Um, Indiana Jones is Harrison Ford and his dad is Sean Connery. And they are, uh, the last crusaders are hunting for what's called the Holy Grail. And if you don't know what the Holy Grail is, it's, it's the cup that Jesus did communion from um, in the Last Supper. But in the movie, it's also the cup that was the chalice that was used to catch blood from Jesus' side when he's on the cross. And, um, and so this chalice, Holy Grail, is believed to be able to grant eternal life if anybody is able to drink from it. And um, if you remember the scene um, uh, in the movie, um, it was pretty powerful. Um, the problem was when Indiana Jones is, is trying to find this with his father, <clears throat> the Nazis are trying to find it too. And so they both end up at the same place at the same time. And so uh, the Nazi, uh, Donovan is his name, um, he shoots um, Henry um, and as a way to force Indiana Jones to go and get the chalice to save his life. And then he's going to basically kill him all over again and get the chalice from them. Um, but there were three challenges that were laid out in this book that Indiana Jones' father had, had put together. Three challenges were the breath of God. Remember these? If you remember the breath of God, the word of God, and the path of God. The breath of God was only the penitent will pass. So you had to go into a particular area uh, bowing. And if you didn't, these two saw two things would cut you in half. And so in the word of God, you have to do these, step on these things, spelling out the Latin version of Jehovah. And if you'd step somewhere wrong, you'd crash to the bottom. And then the last one is this one called the path of God. And so um, it's, so a leap from the lion's head would prove his worth. So I thought it would be fun just to show you that part of the movie today to make it real for you. Yeah, thanks you guys. The healing power of the grail is the only thing that can save your father now. It's time to ask yourself what you believe. Well, there you go. Now you want to go home and watch it, right? <laughs> well, we didn't show the first two because that wasn't the point. The point was this one. But it's, there's some truth to it, right? When we feel like God's leading us a particular way, I, although I don't step like this ever. Um, 
I would probably go like this a little bit. <laughs> so, but you know what I'm saying, right? Is, is that's a big step to see what's ahead of you and know there's no way you're going to make that. But then you take that first step. This is how God works in that winding together the trusting God and then and following up with obedience. I just want to do a quick workup, though. I mean, I mean, well, first of all, just, that resonates with so many people, that clip and this concept, right? Is the, that resonates with us because it's really where we find ourselves at many times in turning, uh, at turning points of our life, whether, whether it's education, a family, or getting married, or career changes, or moves, is that there's a lot of buildup sometimes, and, and we are just trusting that God will get us through or paint away. Our family's been through that a number of times, and you, you, you learn that God has got you. Don't do something stupid or foolish or rash. Commit it to prayer, commit it to counsel, commit it to time, but God has got you. It's hard for God to catch you when you're being rash, but um, in fact, that's why in this movie, by the way, the plot behind it is that nobody had ever made it this far before. In fact, they, anybody in the movie never made it first. The first one, only the pennant will pass because they all got cut and, um, and all their skeletons are there. So that's not, for our, that's not our Christian message, but that is, um, <laughs> that's, that's speaking to being rash. <laughs> and so anyway, hey, I just want to do a qu quick and simple workup. Um, of the word trust, and I use, I'm using an acronym they came up with, and so um, T-R-U-S-T, -T, right, trust. So the first one is take God at his word. This is how we learn to trust. Take God at his word. Essential ingredients, uh, ingredient of growth in your, is your ability to trust God in what he says, which now behind that is, is motivation to understand what he's saying, which you find in his word that he has brought painstakingly to us. I say painstakingly because not only did people uh, write the scriptures under the anointing of the spirit or leading of the spirit, uh, many women and many men and women over the years transported it to a place where it was finally uh, assembled together in what today we call the Holy Bible. Written over thousands of years, multiple, many authors, but God has brought it together for us to read, and so we have to use that. Taking God at His word means that um, we we if you if you came to faith in Christ and never ha imagine if you came to faith in Christ and never had the assurance through the Scriptures, which is the root of the authority, that your sins were forgiven. What would your Christian life be like? If you came to faith in Christ, you go, God, I, I confess my sin. Please forgive me for my sin, but had nothing backing up that God actually did it. Do you think that would impact your Christian walk? Of course it would. But where do we find in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from our life. So we have assurances through the scripture that we can take God at his word. Not only because somebody said it is, but because also because we've lived it and shown it to be true. There's also the, the, the assurance of guidance. That God will give guidance to our life. There's also the assurance of, of answered prayer. There's many assurances that we have in the scripture, but we have to take God at his word. So no one has ever failed all the good promises of God unless they haven't read them. So even in, um, in uh, where was I, 1 Kings, it says, praise to the Lord who has given rest to his people, Israel, just as he promised. No one world has, word has failed of all the good promises he gave us through his servant Moses. May the Lord your God be with us as he ha has, was with our fathers. May he never leave us or forsake us. And then Hebrews 2 says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. Again, I will put my trust in him. So these scriptures need to be in us so that they can build us up in knowing that we can trust in God's word. So T for trust, R for remind yourself and rest in God's revealed truth. You have to bring to mind what God has promised. So first, or John 14, one through four, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Now this is the time when the disciples and the apostles are getting really antsy because Jesus is speaking about his departure. And they're getting a little anxious about what do we do when you're gone? 
Who, what do we do? What's our role? We've had this great teaching, and then what happens? They haven't yet come to believe that he's going to raise from the dead, and so you're, hey, our leader's going to die, and like other leaders of old, what happens to the followers? Will be it slaughtered or annihilated? What's we to do? And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So he's really combining their trust in God that they already have established through their upbringing to, being tr- to, to have trust in him. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I will have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Here's the key. And if I go, I will come back. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back so you can be with me where I am. And you know the place to where I'm going. So his thing, trust in God, trust also in me. So he's evoking themselves to remember that he's trust, trustworthy. You, ultimately God, will do what is right from his judgment of what is right. This is a hard one. And for those of you who have been the recipients of bad behavior, maybe criminal behavior, backstabbing, backstabbing uh, abandonment, um, All of these things are really deep and hard to sort through. But here's what Jesus did. When he was mistreated, when he was maligned, he was misrepresented, not only by the crowds, but even sometimes from the people closest to him. And what did Jesus do? It says in 1 Peter, when when they heard the insults insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He didn't... uh, when he was suffered, he didn't make any threats back. I'm going to get you, that kind of thing. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. This is hard to do, but it's the right thing to do. So you need to have this in your arsenal when you are the recipient of being passed over for a job or a raise that you should have got, the earned, you worked for, that somebody else got. You weren't treated justly. That's the point. You weren't treated fairly. That's the point. But what are you going to do? Are you going to try to get in there and manipulate the system? And if you're the IT guy, you take everybody's email down? Or you know, I'm going to trust myself to the one who judges justly. And you know what you do? You take the retaliation out of your hands and put it in God's. But if you retaliate, God's free. Do you want God sticking up for you? Or do you want to stick up for you? It comes down to trusting and obeying. You trust it, then some things you won't do, Right? Ultimately, God will do what's right from his standpoint of what is right. And you should be able to trust in that. And you may be on the beginning of that, and there are baby steps you can take, but God will help you. And in every area, God is trustworthy. Sovereignty of God rules all human activity for us. You know, God's sovereignty is what's summed up in omniscience, his omnis, omniscience, omnipotence, Uh, omnipresence, God's presence everywhere, his power is everywhere. So ultimately, the sovereignty of God rules all human activity. And so in in this, we can trust in God. In fact, a couple scriptures come to mind. Psalm 115, we trust in God. Psalm 115, I'm sorry, 115.3 says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that pleases him. So when we're looking for the sovereignty of God over all human activity, God is going to do what pleases him regardless of what other people say he should do. Job 42, and you know a little bit about Job's story. I know you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You need to get that in your craw that God's purposes cannot be uh, derailed or misguided. His purposes will take, you have to have faith that that's the God you believe in. We do believe in that God. And Isaiah 46, remember the former things of old, uh, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and the ancient time uh, things have not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. If you need to take this, these scriptures into your prayer time and read them to yourself until they get into your mind and they get into your soul and this is, tell yourself, this is what I believe. And you say, soul, believe this. God's in heaven. He does all that pleases him. Soul, believe that God's purposes cannot be thwarted. We have to get that inside of us, which builds his character in our lives. We can trust him. And then lastly, um, testimony, the, the T, 
the TRUST testimony. And here's the thing, and maybe you've heard me say it before in a different way, but um, the testimony, that's you're building your own story out of trusting God. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way. But your journey is the journey that actually the scriptures say he's the author and perfecter of our faith, right? Uh, Hebrews 12, 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand is the place of authority. Uh, so anyway, so the testimony. So he's the author and perfecter, which means if you think of it as a book, Again, this is a metaphor. There's a book in heaven, has your name on it, Craig Gortz. Page one, chapter one. He was born in Palmer, Alaska. And then you just keep turning the pages, right? And the thing that's really crazy about when you think of Jesus as the author of our faith is not only is he the forerunner, rather, he's lived that faith, but he's also now the one who's helping to build into our life that faith. And... Um, the great thing about any great novel, any great story, with every page turn, there's a new plot twist, there's a new character introduced, somebody's maybe removed, things are introduced that you don't know are going to happen until you turn that page, you go, what's going to happen now? This is how Jesus, in the, in, the, in, the, in the cooperation of writing our story, if you invite him in, he will take the pen and he will begin to write your story. You can trust Jesus to write your story. He's the author of not only the faith of what you believe, but he's the author of how that faith is played out in your life. If you're going to be a person of faith that trusts God and is doing the best you can to obey God, and by the way, obedience isn't on some scale of one to 10, so much as it is, did you try? Is it a pass or fail? Sometimes. E for effort, but... But sometimes, I mean, and maybe there's a place for a grid, but it's not that we're, we're striving for perfection. That in every opportunity, in every scenario, I did exactly what God wanted me to do. That's not even what he's after. He's after a heart that is willing to make changes to your plans, make changes to your mind, make changes to your spending, who you hang out with, all of these things in order to follow and comply with his loving kindness for your life. And so when it says that the testimony that you're building is built upon a faith journey with him, that is a testimony that has power. It's not a testimony that says, well, you know, I was born and then tried to figure things out for a few years. And then, then one day I got really sick and, and then got really serious with God. But by that time, I didn't have much life left to live. And so, I mean, that's not God's story. There's a whole bunch of adventure and excitement and highlights in there. And finally, when we get to heaven, that's the culmination of our story. Um, but here's the thing. He, he, not only is Jesus the captain, the chief leader of our faith, uh, he's the perfecter of it. He's the one who brings about scenarios that help bring our, the polishing of our faith. It, it, it means he's the completer or finisher. When you start on a journey with Jesus, he doesn't just kick you out and then you just drive around wherever you want to go. He's going to see you through the completion line. I mean, what a great relationship he has and seeing us from beginning to end. It's up to him to deliver us onto the other side, right? And so when we're building our testimony, remember in, in Revelation 12, it talks about in the end times how people overcame um, was they triumphed over the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And so when, even when death is on the line, following Christ is going to be a better uh, payback uh, than trying to avoid death. You know, and speaking of testimony, there are a couple, when I was thinking about this part of the story, there are a couple of people that come to mind. A couple of people in particular, many people come to mind. In particular, a couple that I met at, when I was on staff at another church. And it all started one Sunday, best of my recollection anyway, it all started one Sunday when, uh, like here, we, we will, at the end of a service, we'll call people forward for prayer, and there was this couple over here, and uh, kneeling, and so I went up and said, hey, what's going on, what can we pray with you about? And basically, um, Albert said, you know, I'm, 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 at, I'm at a job, I build trucks, and he wasn't always a Christian, and has become a Christian, and is really just trying to figure out how to be a Christian in an environment where 
the history of his experience is not a Christian. And then his wife, Christy, same thing. She said, she goes, I, I really have a burden for my dad who's not with the Lord. In fact, my dad um, is not well. And whenever we, and he's not open to the gospel. In fact, quite antagonistic to the gospel. So whenever one of the people in the family, especially the sisters, bring up the gospel, not only is he resistant, he curses at them and drives them away to get them to shut up. And at that point, all of the sisters had pretty much done that, except for Christy. But their prayer was a thing. It was the same thing. Their prayer request, how do we make a difference in the environments that we're in? How can I make a difference for my dad? And Albert was, how can I make a difference in my workplace? And you know, in a moment like that at an altar, there's no like magic potion or pixie dust you sprinkle over things, but there's a concept and a principle that's really the same. And quite frankly, as a pastor, when a pastor gives advice or, or prays and, and says something, it's really up to you. It's not up to me to follow them around and make sure it happened, but it was really simple instruction. It's instruction I give you, to you and anybody who comes to me. I say, ask God what to do and then do it. And I emphasize just do it. You talk yourself out of it. You create these scenarios where what if this and what if that and forget it. You have to discipline your mind to not go there. Just ask God, what should I do? And then do it as best as you can. And as a result, in the months that followed, I'm talking with Albert and he's like, this one story in particular, he goes, he goes, you know, I, I was actually moved into QA, quality assurance. So these trucks that he's building as they come off the line, all these things to check. And he's, has, he's been there a long time, got a lot of seniority, but he ends up working with this gal, Elizabeth, who was the pain in everybody's side. If I remember the story right, she chewed tobacco. I mean, again, I, was less, I don't think she had all of her teeth, but the main thing was, I mean, I don't know many women who chew tobacco, but they're pretty rough and tumble when they do. And... Um, so his first day on the job, he was in a safety meeting, and it's 20 people in this room, and, and he's, um, she goes after him. He's never even been in a meeting about why he didn't do certain things. He goes, I don't, I mean, and in those scenarios, cussing happens, finger pointing happens, yelling happens, and nobody leaves with peace. And so she goes after him, and his Christian character kicked in, and he's like, I'm not going to retaliate, I'm not going to come after her, and he said, okay, I'll do better. And he's never even been to a security meeting or a safety meeting before. So, but he took the high road, right? And so from that day forward, she was the bane in the existence of many people in QA. 20-some people, right? And then one day, I mean, and, and Albert and I had been meeting over the months, and that comes up. And, and you know, I said, you know, the same thing. Just ask God, what should I do? And he'll tell you, and then you just do it. Well, there was a time where she was not at work for quite an extended period of time, some days, and then a week, and he found out she was in the hospital. The other part about Elizabeth is that she would, in a week's time, uh, drink a couple gallons of vodka. And why she was in the hospital is because her liver was failing. And you know what the Lord said to Albert? I want you to go get her a card and go around and have everybody sign it. And he said to me, that is so ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody will sign that card. But when he reported to me, he had to go get a second card. Because even though in her gruffness, in her swearing, in her backbiting and gossiping, God was speaking to her, not knowing maybe that's what, Albert couldn't have known that. And, it was, God, it was speaking to him, I should say, to do that as a way to minister to her. And so he and another Christian buddy went around and got signatures. Hope you get well soon. We miss you. Maybe some of them were lies. I don't know. But um, <laughs> they, they, they were trying to tell a story to a human being who everybody knew what she was and what she represented. Get this. Following God, he could just take the cards and go drop them off. No, he goes in. Says the Lord says him to go in. And he goes... I, we got you some cards. Would you be okay if I prayed for you? She said, yes. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yeah, a long time ago. Well, let's pray that God will forgive you and be in your life. And she was open to that. She came back to work a week or so later, 
And I just recounted this part of the story with Albert yesterday to make sure it was accurate, but in many ways, she was a different person. The edge of the cussing and the backbiting, all those things seemed to have subsided. And she actually went and thanked him for doing the cards and coming and praying. And just a few weeks later, she passed away. Yeah, and it's a moving story, isn't it? But it came from one guy saying, I can make a difference in the place where I build trucks. And so since then, I appointed him as the pastor. <laughs> the pastor on, on site. Of, of course, there's no real appointment. It's just all him and the Lord. But since then, many, 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 many stories have come up of, from that one principle of trusting and obeying. And Christie's story unfolds really similarly, where she is <clears throat> asking for the Lord's intervention in her father's life. So this guy was in the mafia in Kansas City. He was in the, in the mob and was a felon. So he was rough and tumble himself and very resistant to the gospel. And she felt like the Lord had said, I just want you to call him. On a regular basis, she would call him. And anytime it drifted to the gospel, he got very antagonistic and very angry and very upset. And she just felt like the Lord kept telling her to keep the path, uh, the communication pathways open. And she did. And um, to one point where, I'll tell this last little piece of the story, they were getting ready to go to Disneyland with their two girls. And such a strong impression from the Lord that you should not go to Disneyland. You need to go see your father. But don't tell him you're coming. And she goes, how in the world could I tell my kids that? And if I remember the story right, Albert felt the same prompting. So they explained to the girls what was happening. And they were in agreement. We should go take care of Grandpa. And that became a turning point in their relationship. And I'm, I'm going to actually ask Christy to come up and help tell the rest of the story. So this is Christy McCon. She actually works with us in finance with Laurel and been a friend of mine for quite a while. So you can come up here, Christy. Thank you. So pick up on the story from where I left off. Well, we decided to go to Missouri to care for my father, who had been dying for about six months, but I didn't know what from. He had liver cirrhosis, but he also had kidney failure. He was a lifelong drinker. Um, so he was just wasting away, and every day that I would talk to him, um, he got worse and worse, and came to the point on Labor Day weekend in 2012 that when I called him, he had said um, he had, to put it nicely, he'd been able to, unable to get to the restroom that weekend and couldn't clean himself up or the house, so he'd been sitting there for three days in and amongst all of that. So I knew something had changed, and that's what prompted the Lord said, it's time to go, and I'm a planner. So I'm like, okay, I'll go. My family can go on vacation. That's fine. And he's like, nope, the four of you need to go. I wrestled with the Lord for about 10 minutes in the living room. Nope, this isn't possible. We all four can't go. That's not necessary. Nope, all four need to go. So I had to go tell my husband we weren't going to go. And it was camping. That's our Disneyland. We yeah, right. Camping, That's, oh, yeah, oh, camping. That was our Disneyland. <laughs> okay, well, I want <laughs> to go to Disneyland, I guess. So, so okay. I had to go tell my husband we couldn't okay. go. And I was like, this isn't going to work. There's just no way. How am I going to convince my family we're going to do this? And I walked outside, ugly crying, you know, <laughs> and I couldn't even talk. And I told my husband, and the only thing he said was, okay, well, we don't have any luggage, so I'll go borrow some from the neighbor. And he took off. <laughs> and funny. that was it. And yeah. we made plans, and he began to get excited like a vacation. I kept saying, you don't know what you're going into. This is the devil's playground we're going back to. You have no clue. You have no clue what we're going into. And he soon found out. Yeah. And so we showed up, and my dad did not know we were going to come, and it was clearly obvious he couldn't. He hasn't been taking care of himself for months, and so we just began to clean his house, take him to the doctor, uh, pray over him. He allows us to pray over him, and we serve him. We love him. He's difficult still. Um, when we were in the hospital one time, I approached him, and I said, you know, Dad, there's more than today to think about. There's a day coming that we all have to think about. And his response at that time was, well, if I don't get better, the whole world can go to H-E-double-L. -L. <laughs> that was his response to me. And I said, okay, we'll try again tomorrow. That was kind of my philosophy the whole time. Every time you'd hang up, We'll try again tomorrow. Every time he, he berated me, we'll try again tomorrow. The Lord removed all unforgiveness and bitterness that I had toward my dad mm -hmm. so that I could serve him mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus because there's a day coming for all of us that is important. And um, 
So we left Missouri with no change in his condition spiritually, and he was continued to decline. And um, we experienced many, many miracles along the way, what we were there, too many to go into today. Mm -hmm. But um, when we got home, he was in a rehab facility, really should have been in hospice, but he was in a rehab facility. And I was talking to him on a Sunday after church, and he was slurring his words, and I could not understand him. And I actually got a little impatient and said, OK, Dad, I think I'm going to let you go. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And he said, hey, if you said one of those prayers for me, I'd listen. And mm -hmm. so I was kind of leaning back on the couch, and when he said that, I went, okay, <laughs> yeah, dear Lord right. Jesus. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I didn't hesitate. <laughs> and uh, so we prayed, and then he asked about how, how he could spend eternity with the Lord, and he asked some questions, and he said, okay, I want to pray. All this through mumbling. And sure. I said, okay, repeat after me. And he, every word that he said was so clear he enunciated every syllable, every right. word through that entire prayer. And when he said amen, he went right back to slurring his words. And I know that was the Lord's gift to yeah, me amen. so that I did not doubt that this right. was really what happened. And sure. uh, he died the next day. Yeah, powerful. So Christy, from the time you guys made the visit, obviously there was history before that, but from the time you made the visit till the time he passed, how long was that time? Five weeks? Yeah. Yeah, very short. So the trust and obey where it comes down to the practical living of life, I, we've processed this a little bit, the thinking back of what if we wouldn't have changed our vacation plans? Oh, yeah. And how that became such a, a setup for the next season. And I think I was accurate in saying it had alienated most everybody in the family. And so you were really the only one that had access to him. Yeah, when he was at home that weekend in a mess, yeah. my sister was 20 minutes away and he didn't call her. Yeah. It's not that he prefer preferred me over her. The enemy had just isolated him. Yeah, right, right. Amen. Any takeaways that you have from that experience? I know you're condensing you know, many months and a lot of prayers. And I, Actually, at one point, he had full kidney failure, you said, mm -hmm. but he was healed of that to extend the time that you and he were able to interact and bring him to this place. Is that Right. One of the right times it? he was in the hospital, I kept asking, what about his kidneys? And the doctor said, his kidneys are fine. I'm like, well, that's impossible. He was in stage three kidney failure. You don't come back from that. Right. And then I realized, oh, well, of course you do when the Lord's involved. And the Lord has a plan, of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, think of the love of the Lord that heals a guy's kidneys so he has long enough to accept Christ before he dies. Yeah. Right? Amen. Amen. Any Amen. takeaways? Dive deep into the scriptures. Listen to the Lord. Yeah. Cut out the distractions so that you can hear those still yeah. small voices yeah. when he tells you to do something. Surround wow. yourself with people of faith that can lift you in prayer. Yeah. People like Pastor Craig. We walked through this with Carrie and Eric Olson. They were mm. also tremendously mm -hmm, helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, Roz and the family for all those nights he was late to dinner. It's our fault. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sorry. It's Thank worth you it for all, that. right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Um, trust the Lord. His words, it's life. They're sure. not idle words. They are life. And yeah. he desires a faith response from all of us. Yeah. And he moves in our life yeah. in hopes that we will believe. Amen. Don't Amen. just continue to dive deep. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Let's give her a hand, everybody. Amen. Thank you. Wow. You know, I use that as an illustration for us because... Um, the, this is sometimes and often what's at stake, isn't it? Is that God's asking us to trust in what he's speaking to us and to follow through with it because we don't know what's at stake. That's why the trust and obey have to go together like one foot in front of the other. He knows and he's just looking for us to not have all of the junk and the clutter that keeps us from, well, you have to let me know what's going on or you need to tell me what 10 steps is from now. Like Chrissy said, it, and, and, and Albert, it's a, sometimes praying in the moment, but there's a lot of things that are happening before that. And um, oh, so it's, it's not necessarily always a linear thing. There's a lot of dynamic to it, but that's why the trust is so important. We trust the heart, the character, and the intention of God, and so it leads us to a willingness to obey in areas that are outside our realm of comfort, or even outside our realm of experience, or outside our realm of what we want to do. But what's at stake in God's world is of tantamount value. The soul of a person is now in heaven because somebody changed their vacation plan and wouldn't be stiff-armed and was willing and ready to step in to the prayer time. Amen? 
I mean, who's to say God couldn't use you that way? He can use you that way, and he will use you that way if you trust and obey. And today, you can start that journey by going, God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Say it to your soul until it gets in there. Whether you feel like your soul believes it or not, you keep saying it. And then God will start speaking to you. I can all but guarantee he'll speak to you. Whether you hear it or follow up with it is really entirely up to you. But I can guarantee it won't necessarily be in the cookie cutter ways that we like to organize our life. It'll make us do some things and go some places we wouldn't probably go or do on our own. It'll cost us something. But what's at stake is God's kingdom. And, you know, in Philippians 2, let me close with this. I thought I'd be heavy on the trust and close up with the obey. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it's really talking about what's called the kenosis, Jesus becoming a man, emptying emptying his deity into a man. Um, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset that was in Christ Jesus for who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking up the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, saying he's a man. It says this, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross, the most humiliating way to die. Not just death, but humiliation connected with that. Shame connected with that. Where did obedience lead Jesus? To die. For purpose. Obviously not just to die at a sadistic ritual, but because there's a purpose. And with, without, it doesn't say it, but at what level do you think Jesus trusted God with the outcome of his obedience? In fact, it says it at one point when Jesus is agonizing in the garden of Gethsemane, it talks about not my will, but your will be done. If there's a way for this cup to be passed from me, he's acknowledging there is another way that I could head, but I'm only acknowledging it. I'm not entertaining it or want to go there. And, and he, he, it says he entrusted himself to the one who could actually deliver him from death. But the main thing is that Jesus knew, not that God would deliver him from having to die, but on the other side of death, God would deliver him from the hold of death. And in some of our thinking, we have to be able to trust, even in the areas where something dies, on the other side with God, there is life. Jesus trusted God and obeyed God to that that same level. It says in Hebrews 5 that uh, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up loud cries with tears to the one who could save him from death. And although he was God's son, he was heard because of his reverent submission. And he learned, learned, learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus didn't have to go from disobedient to obedient he learned obedience, which means that he practiced obedience and, and, and there and by earned himself obedience. But he learned to obey in the midst of suffering, which is a great deterrer to suffering. If I can take a path that avoids suffering, I'll take it. But if being obedient to God means I'm on that path, then you stay on that path. And here's the thing. This will rock your world theologically. <laughs> Why was he heard? Jesus' prayers were heard not because he was the son of God, not because he was the author of life along with God. He was heard because of his reverent submission in thus proving that he was going to trust God at every endeavor and obey God at every sacrifice. You have to chew on that for a while. But here's what God's calling us to do today is that, that adage of trusting and obeying. Trusting and obeying. We've seen where it started in Genesis. We've seen how it kind of works through different aspects of Scripture and obeying God and having the testimonies of people who have lived the same life that you're living, trusting God, obeying as best they can, and the outcomes are fruitful. And then we have Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who who endured the cross and became obedient even to death on a cross. And that's why I think where some of us need maybe some repair 
we've tried to trust God or we said we trusted God and God gave us a path to obey and we, we abandon it. And that's why James 1.5 comes to mind where it says, if you lack wisdom, ask God to give uh, generously without finding fault and that wisdom will be given to you. And the reason I read that scripture is because if we lack wisdom, we ask God he gives to us generously but he also says without finding fault. You may have asked God and he's may have given you direction and you haven't taken it. He's not gonna hold that against you. Okay? You're free from not following God in the past where you felt like he's leading you to follow you, you never did. He's not gonna hold that against you. God is for you, not against you. And so what God's gonna do is start the process all over again. You want to trust and obey? Trust me for this, follow me in this. And use that as a new launching pad to begin to follow and trust and obey the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I realize I went a little late. I apologize. So we'll, we'll um, give you a chance to respond to pray. And if the team can come to be uh, able to pray with you. I just want to ask you really, though, uh, as a concluding, kind of concluding thought, if you're here today and um, you've never trusted in Christ, You've never followed Christ. You've never had any inkling to follow Christ. Maybe you've never even thought about it. And you know today that you're not in a right relationship with Christ, uh, but you would like to be. I would like to pray with you as we close. We have to know who you are, obviously. And, um, but I would just ask you to consider, is, is, is Christ something or someone that you um, feel is knocking at the door of your heart, so to speak. That would show up with a little bit of maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, elevated heart rate, maybe. You're, maybe your palms are a little sweaty. Maybe you're getting a little anxious. You know that your heart's not right with God, but you want it to be. All we need to do is, is pray. Making that relationship right is really just one prayer away where you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart and forgive my sin. That's the simplicity of it. But if you're here, hearing my words, um, I just ask you to consider if, if you're not right in your heart with the Lord in knowing him, then um, I'd ask you to consider that. So uh, let's bow our heads for a moment and pray. If you're in that place where you know you're not right with the Lord, I'd like to pray with you if you would like us to. Um, could you just show me who you are by just raising your hand up for a minute and we'll acknowledge that and you can put your hand down and then we'll, we'll move on. But... Um, Somebody here today where you know in your heart you're not right with the Lord, you know your sins are not forgiven, but you would like them to be. Amen. Hard to see the way back, but I don't think I see any hands. And so, amen. <clears throat> well, why don't you stand with me since we're a little over our time. I'll pray a closing prayer. But here's the call that I would like to have you respond to. If you're in a place where you want to renew that journey of trusting God, if you feel like you've derailed trusting God and then following up with obeying God and you want to kickstart it back in, I'd just like to have you kind of come in and pray and whether it's just with yourself or you want somebody to pray with you, you can ask somebody to pray. But um, if you're looking for better, or not better, bigger um, things in your trust relationship with the Lord, uh, we ask you to come and pray with that in mind too. But I'll pray. As I pray, you can come and then in my prayer, I'll dismiss us and you can still come after that. Um, but so, Lord, we, just, we do thank you, Lord, that your kindness to us, it does lead us down a path. And that path that it leads us down to is you. And we like the fact that you don't just give us commands and ask us to blindly follow them. But you call us into a relationship where we're, we're expected to and will need to trust you. Trust your words and trust your character and trust your heart and trust that uh, trust into your hands the outcome of those things you're asking us to do. Our lives are enriched and your kingdom purpose is fulfilled when we trust you and then obey you. And so, Lord, we come today and for those who it's applicable to, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for not following you when we said we would and we just didn't. Either we got too scared or we got too uh, tied up with time and we didn't invest in following you. But Lord, we th we're sorry for that. And we may not make it every time in the future, but if we can make it another time, that's better than not making it at all. And so we ask you, Lord, to forgive us for that. 
And I ask you, Lord, today, through your Holy Spirit, to everybody with, within the sound of my voice, that you would uh, bestow upon us, God, a, a deeper seated of trust, but also, Lord, how it plays itself out in following you down a particular way. For the things that we're anxious for in our heart, for the things that have a longing in our heart, Lord, we trust you for them. In Christ's great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you'd like, find your way to a place of prayer today and commit those things to the Lord. And um, the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Thank you.